Tag, mein Name ist H.R. Giger. Begriff habe, was Kunst sei, sondern Künstler da zwei gebracht habe. Ne? Ja. <lacht> das in dem Meistens ist jemand, wenn man, wenn man so wissen will, dass das die einflussreichen Geschlechter sind, muss man auf den Friedhof. Mit welchen Leuten, mit welchen Fa Familien man Geschäfte soll oder so, dann muss man auf den Friedhof, die, die das grösste Grab haben, die einflussreichsten. Die Sachen, die passiert sind, das äh, habe ich eigentlich sofort eigentlich Abstand dazu, auch wenn jemand gestorben ist oder so, ist das äh, meistens... Äh, habe ich da kein, kein Problem, auch mit den Eltern nicht oder so. Ich will es nicht so genau wissen. Mhm. Auch nicht, wenn ich wegen Krankheit oder so. Ich habe Paul immer gesagt, äh, ich möchte. Also wenn ich, ich will nicht wissen, was es ist. Wenn etwas ist, sowieso. Äh, das kann ich den Lebensmut nehmen, total. Aber wenn ich merke, dass mir etwas im Fernsehen oder so zu fest bewegt und so, dann nachher, ähm, also wenn es mir richtig nicht gut tut, dann nachher schaue ich es nicht an.
Also der Kübel wird da eingehängt und dann wird er so hochgezogen, kommt da hinein, dann geht das nach hinten, am Schluss steht er so, dann wird so geschüttelt und das Ganze kann da geöffnet werden und so rausgeklappt und ich habe das früher 19... 1973 habe ich dieses Objekt gemalt und habe auch große Bilder gehabt, die waren 2 Meter mal 1,40 und da war eine große Ausstellung bei Galerie Bischofberger, die hieß Passagen und dort wurden die zum ersten Mal gezeigt, 1973. Alle Bilder sind entstanden mit dem Stuhl, da am Anfang hat er noch eine. Ich bin nicht geschweißt, gell? Ja, jetzt, jetzt ist es ein bisschen besser, gell? Ich bin einer der Bewunderer von Gigas Werk und glaube, dass das, was er macht, sowohl was das, wie er es macht, wie auch das, was er macht, äh, zu den bedeutendsten Erzeugnissen der bildenden Kunst unserer Zeit gehört. Es gibt meines Wissens äh, zurzeit niemanden, der sich mit dem Schrecklichen so liebevoll auseinandersetzt wie der Giger. Ich meine, dass der Giger alles gezeigt hat, was in diesem Abgrund zu sehen ist. Und jetzt frage ich mich schon immer öfter, wann kommt Giger zurück? Dann sagt er auch, das ist höllisch. Gut. Es ist schön, was er malt. Und das Grauen ist so schön dargestellt, dass es seinen Schrecken verliert. Gerade die Luftpinselmalereien, diese Berührungslosigkeit durch die Hand, das ist wie Zauberei, das ist schon auch ein ästhetisches Moment, das er in die bildende Kunst gebracht hat, wie keiner vor ihm und das kann niemand so wie er. Ich habe es probiert, aber ich kann das nicht. Und das ist sehr gut, das sollte auch so sein, dass die äh, Kunsthistoriker sich einmal auch damit beschäftigen, wie einmalig der Giga ist. Nicht? Der Giga ist ein Phänomen, auch von seinem Talent her, das, das kann nicht jeder. Ja, also so redet es sich leicht, wenn man 75 ist. Mehr Kulpa. <lacht> Thank you.
war eine große Angst für einen Atomkrieg. Das hat gegipfelt in 263 mit der Kuba-Krise. Da hatten Leute sehr Angst, dass ein Nuklearkrieg ausbrechen könnte. Und was wir wussten von Hiroshima und so, die Monstrositäten, die genetisch da geschaffen wurden, das hat Giger sehr beeindruckt und beeinflusst. Und seine ersten Zeichnungen in Tusche waren, nannte er die Atomkinder, die Atombabys. Wie wenn ein Krieg, ein nuklearer Krieg gewesen wäre und amputiert, das Monströse, das aus, dem, aus den Strahlungen äh, entstehen konnte. 67. Früher, als er solche Sachen ausstellte, spuckte man auf die Schaufenster der Galerien oder warf Joghurtkübel oder Hundekot, verschmierten die, äh, die, äh, die Vitrinen und die Schaufenster, weil die Leute waren sehr schockiert. It is so realistic, you know, I mean... Uh It is a lot of fantasy, and probably with a meaning behind it. I mean, he is doing things no one else is doing. And if one man can inspire the whole world like that, then you must be a genius. But I'm sure there's also a big clan who hate the work, you know? I mean, yeah, it is always 50-50 this. I myself uh, admire uh, very much the art of Hans Rudi Giger, not because just of that um, uh, supreme uh, technical skill that goes into the work, but just the depth of his psychological insight, the profound understanding of the psyche that um, goes way beyond anything that is known in traditional psychiatry. I don't know any other artist who really portrays so accurately, so realistically, the experiences from, from the depths uh, of the psyche. Hans Rudi Giger's art is uh, usually referred to as biomechanoid, which is the, the combination of the mechanical and the biological. And this is really something that characterizes what happened in the 20th century, where more and more the, um, the world, uh, world of technology, the world of machines, you know, from mechanical machines to computers, uh, have been sort of taking over our life and we got so entangled with this world 
that in a sense we became victimized. Then another aspect that you find in his art is the demonic. And again, you, you see a lot of the demonic elements sort of coming up, you know, from um, uh, Charles Manson and, uh, and uh, LaVey's satanic church in San Francisco to uh, the terrorists. Uh, the activities certainly have many kind of a satanic, uh, satanic aspects. We have no clue how to, how to understand these really shadow, these shadow aspects of humanity. The configuration that uh, Giger is born with, the, the square from Pluto, which represents this uh, dark underworld Dionysian energy. But in Giger's case, he has two other things in his chart which uh, inflect this energy in particular ways. On the one hand, he has uh, Venus opposite to Neptune. This uh, brings out the artistic, aesthetic uh, dimension in a highly refined uh, almost exquisite way. This combination is perfectly corresponding to the two, these two different configurations in his chart, the one relating to Mars and Pluto and Saturn, this more aggressive, demonic, uh, violent, uh, dark underworld quality, and then this more exquisite, aesthetically um, uh, delicate, precise, also highly imaginative, but expressed through the art. The Sun and Mercury are both in a square to Uranus. This we find where there is often a, um, a very uh, a certain element of individualistic gen creative genius, where there's something uh, you know, like Galileo had it, a, a rebel against the mainstream, someone who does something, who's willing to do something that doesn't fit the conventional, in this case, artistic conventions or cultural uh, structures of what's taboo or not. just thinking, looking at this garden and then remembering when I was here for the first time, I was still trying to figure out who is this guy I became friends with. Giger makes room for other people's creativity working with him you also get a chance to create art together with him and 
that's very rare. Contrary to what people believe, that Giger is difficult to work with, he's the easiest man to work with. He will listen to you if you have good ideas, and he doesn't care where they come from. Uh, both of us may be a little bit naive, and sometimes easy to take advantage of. Hey, a little quiet in there. We're making a documentary. Yeah. There we That's go. also very nice to hear a woman's voice coming from Giga's room. And he's very happy nowadays. <laughs> with Giger obviously was through film and his design work for Aliens. I don't know, I think he kind of taps into this sort of uh, like a hybridization, you know, in the sort of the science fiction lexicon, you know, the biomechanical aspects of what he has worked on and what he's developed, you know, and Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury, all those sort of ideas also of how, uh, you know, organisms may develop into something that is ultimately more than human. Much of science fiction probably owes a, a debt to Giger and vice versa. I mean, I think they're intrinsically locked. Like in the Greek, uh, you know, the Greek myths with the, uh, the Minotaur and, and Medusa and things like that, I think he offers another level uh, uh, of that par kind of part of our psyche, that, that need for those types of images. He's caught people's attention and many eyes are looking towards him. And I was shown the book N uh, necro Necronomica, okay, um, in Los Angeles, in fact by O'Bannon, who brought it in, and I nearly fell off the desk, said, that's it, and uh, why look farther? And uh, so that's how I saw it, it was as simple as that. I've never been so certain about anything in my life. <laughs> He scared the shit out of everybody in this country, plain and simply. It wasn't a movie or a creature that was silly or unbelievable or, again, a little green man with a laser or a robot, you know? All of a sudden, you had somebody that really, in a tangible way, made everybody's biggest nightmare come true.
My name is Vincent Castiglia. I'm a New York-based custom tattoo artist. The name of my practice is Omega Tattoo. Only about five years ago, I did my first uh, Giger tattoo. Uh, approaching it was surely different than any tattoo I had done prior. Um, the preparation involved, you know, was of, uh, you know, it was a, of a more exhaustive nature. Studying the image, making the stencil. Uh, making sure that everything was in its uh, proper place and then the approach in terms of the execution. For a lot of clients I'm sure it is a mode of acquiring some sort of armor. Giger tattoos have taken the most you know exhaustive amount of time for myself. Even when I'm putting my absolute all uh, in terms of the density and the complexity of a of a project, uh, a Giger tattoo will take more time and require more effort for sure. The Giger work actually became the, uh, the main, uh, I don't know how to put it, but, but it just became like something that I instantly clicked with. Uh, it was almost as if it was, uh, it was supposed to be on me. Um, I'm completely honored to wear his work. Even uh, though it's on my body and I see it all the time, um, I always, you know, find something new about it every time I look at it. Uh, I really never get bored of looking at it. It's, um, it's like as if I just got the tattoo. I'm happy with it all over again every time I see it on my body. I think that years and years from now, when you and I are long since gone and the art historians of the world start to talk about Giger, I think that he will finally have been recognized as one of the true great genius artists of his time. People can actually look at this and envision what this is, despite the elements in it and the details and the surface textures that takes you to other places. But if you get beyond it, um, you know, and, and, and not even dwell on the fact of, well, what's, what's he saying? What's his statement about? I don't think we need to dwell on statement with an artist like Eager. I think that for any, any aspects of socio-political interjection in his work and elements of sexuality, elements of the nightmares, I think that, that it, it's all part of who this man is because of his uniqueness. You know, the point is, is that, you know, why do we have to, you know, pigeonhole an artist with such an original mind as Giger? We don't have to. All we have to do is just sit back and enjoy the work.
I am George Petros, and I'm here to talk about H.R. Giger, maybe the most important pop artist of this era, somebody who fuses sex, science fiction, and blood and guts. He invented this thing called biomechanical, the biomechanical universe. Very, very terrifying. And then there was his connection to rock culture, which was pretty in incredible, given that he has only, I think, four album covers that he actually did as commissioned work. Movies, to be in movies, th this is the way that, that art reaches people today. It's not about what's hanging in the Louvre. It's about what's on that Debbie Harry album cover. Americans who like him don't think to themselves, hey, look at this Swiss artist. His stuff blends so seamlessly into the American experience that he's just one of us. People will say, oh, the work frightens me. Now, I don't understand it. I just don't understand that reaction because it's not frightening. Uh, another thing about it is there's nothing accidental about it. He knows exactly what he's doing. It's not this uh, throw an egg against a wall and say, that's how I feel, because that's not art. It's great to have the vision, but to have the vision without the ability to do it well gives us about, in my opinion, 98% of the artists that are uh, doing art today. Giger is a force of nature as much as anything else. You could talk about his creativity or his persona, but the way he stands in our culture right now is sort of this incredible force of nature uh, that, that is more than the sum of, of any painting or any art project he's ever done. The art world has a very short attention span, and everyone's given their proverbial 15 minutes of fame. And he hasn't gotten that yet. He will get them because he's done this substantial body of work, this, you know, this kind of epic vision. We're dealing with this kind of multinational, multi-tentacled, multi-billion dollar industry of auction houses, of the art market itself, of the collectors, of the critics. None of them have heard of Giger, and the few who have, couldn't give it a toss about him. So it's, it's a beautiful moment for Giger's career because it, it actually, it's actually at a point of incredible irrelevance. There's so many ways he could have, uh, you know, as a pop star does, is kind of reinvent himself. And he refuses reinvention. He's like consistently following this singular vision with, with, with blinders on. And that, in the end, is going to sustain itself more than these myriad careers that can, can uh, you know, hit many different generations. He's going to be a signifier for something uh, which is timeless. Here we are in 2005 talking about Giger. It's like he's created his own cliche. I mean, he's almost become a genre. Uh, he's so, so um, distinctive in his style. But one of the most notorious was the H.R. Giger cover for the Dead Kennedys album, Frankenchrist, which was uh, literally a wall of penises and 
derrieres. They came down hard on, on the... Um, on the dead Kennedys, and it was a big, no, notorious court case, back and forth. Giger inadvertently, uh, and, and with the dead Kennedys' full support, um, put an end to the band. You know, the, the album cover, I guess, will remain one of those you know, notorious milestones in censorship and rock history. Giger knows some about the occult and things like that, and he incorporates some occult images and ideas in his artwork. And many Satanists and, and occult people can enjoy his artwork, certainly, you know, it has that dark quality. But um, I don't think Giger would like to be called a Satanist himself. I think he doesn't like that label. He's been a very important part of my life, and in my house, I, I have his art everywhere. I have a Harkonnen chair in my library. I have his sculptures, his jewelry. It's been a profound influence on me, but it's not really something I can really put into words. I guess um, when I'm alone sitting there looking at the paintings, it's, it's sort of like a peaceful dream world. You know, I mean, if you, when you're looking at his airbrush art, the people think it's so disturbing or horrific. The, the people in the artwork look at, like they're at peace maybe even asleep, you know, it's very dreamlike, so, I don't know, that's, I find it very peaceful and dark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the best way I can describe Giger is he is his art. When I first met him, I really didn't think he was part of this world. Um, he's very, very, he oozes artisticness. Um, and everything about him, you see where the art comes from. You, you, you begin to understand where he gets his visions from. he would describe it, but to me music and, and his art are closely related. Um, his art lends itself perfectly for musical interpretation or vice versa. I know he, he's a jazz enthusiast and he has provided the artwork for bands other than, than uh, heavy metal bands. Switzerland is, is a secluded island in the world uh, because of our economic situation Few people actually go into art professionally here. It, it's a huge risk, and, and even even a mundane job here in Switzerland will supply you with with an amazing salary. So nobody is desperate enough to enter a life full of risk, full of uncertainty, full of the inability to plan your life financially by becoming an artist. Um, in Switzerland, you either work in a bank or in an insurance company or something like that, and nobody wants to become an artist because. It carries with it a, a tremendous instability as far as your finances are concerned. So the, the few artists that are actually existing in Switzerland, I'm, I'm not talking about hobby artists, I'm talking about professional artists, um, they tend to be very unusual. They, you have to be much more unusual here in Switzerland, much more outside of the society to actually become an artist here. We met him at one of the galleries in New York right after he got his Academy Award. And um, he was so so nice and so easy to, to get along with. And then the opportunity arose where I was going to make a solo record. And so we asked him if he would be interested, and he said, yeah.
in a sense, it really wasn't a collaboration. It was him, you know, having a, an idea and us saying yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's almost like you can see the things around his head, you know, just sort of happening, like some kind of computer thing happening around his head. Just drop to a dead stop. You know, the surface value is all very simple and calm, but underneath it's this, this power, you know, this, this thing, this throbbing power that's going on, and this control, this force of control, you know, and it, the placid pastoral, you know, landscape, and then, and then underneath this thing that's going on. So, I mean, um, he's very naturally very Swiss in that respect. But, but I've learned Eigenartig, weil er hat ja Schwester und normalerweise sagt man, dass Männer, die eine Schwester haben, ähm, eigentlich nicht so äh, von so einem bezauberten Frauenbild reden, wie er das hat. Oder also. Und er hat schon sehr stark so einen Traum, äh, ein Traumwesen, oder so, wo, wo die, man sieht in den Bildern und so sind die alle hell und schön und so. Und es ist immer das Männliche, das irgendwie morbid daherkommt oder teuflisch daherkommt und so. Und die Frau, die man immer so ähm, ja, feierhaft oder majestätisch oder so. Und, und, und wenn es diabolisch ein bisschen wirkt und so, dann haben sie immer noch ähm, eine, eine unglaubliche Schönheit. Oder?